So uh, my job tonight is to introduce a family that barely knows each other. Uh, I first came across Freeman in 1971. The conceptual artist James Lee Byers was organizing the World Question Center, which was based on the idea that to arrive at an axiology, an understanding of the world's knowledge, you didn't read six million books at the Harvard Widener Library. You identified the 100 most brilliant people in the world, locked them in a room together, kept the doors closed until they asked each other the questions they're asking themselves. Uh, 15, 20 years later, I took that idea and turned it into first something called the Reality Club and now edge.org. But it all started one day when Byers, who was talked in peripatetic mantras, um, repeated over and over, get me to Dyson, the world's smartest man, over and over, like every day, call Dyson, the world's smartest man. And that's how I learned about you. Um, then totally separately, maybe 20 years later, uh, Esther Dyson emerged as the queen of the, well, before, before the web came along, uh, the queen of the PC revolution. And um, she was an analyst that wrote a newsletter that everybody had to read because it was so erudite. And everybody came to a conference, meaning the heads of all the early companies, Microsoft, DEC, Visicorp, et cetera. And her conference was the place to go. I recall at the time, because she swims every day, she always showed up with green hair. And, um, uh, but always, uh, and if you wanted to find her, you had to get out at the pool at 5.30, and you could have some quiet time with her. Um, through her conference, around perhaps the early 80s, I met her brother George, and went to visit him in uh, Vancouver, Canada, where he lived uh, 95 feet up in a tree, in a tree house that was truly frightening. Uh, and uh, there was a house below, eventually came back down. But uh, whereas Freeman is known for uh, building rockets and talking about blasting out in the space using uh, uh, through atomic means, George builds by Dockers, which are Aleutian uh, canoes, basically. Uh, and a book was written about them called The Starship and the Canoe. And yet, uh, they're very similar in interesting ways. Um, two things. Uh, one thing we've done here through the EDGE website is we've tried to reintroduce a discussion about genetics in Germany. So three years ago, Richard Dawkins and Craig Venter were on stage, and it did get national attention, and it did give people permission to talk about a subject which, because of historical reasons, uh, was verboten for quite some time. Uh, if you really want to know about genes, have dinner with the three Dysons. Uh, it's like the New York City third rail is above your head with sparks flying, and regardless of the content, uh, it's scintillating, and it's always brilliant. Uh, that brings us to my adopted German son, Andrian Krei, who is the editor of the Feuilleton, which is the arts uh, letter section of Süddeutsche Zeitung, uh, the largest uh, of the German national papers. And uh, Andrian, uh, along with maybe one or two others in Germany, is uh, one of the most sophisticated thinkers about the digital realm. He's been in it for 25 years, coming from 20 years in Brooklyn, uh, first meeting Timothy Leary on the West Coast and getting into virtual reality. And uh, since I've known him, he's right at the cutting edge in everything that matters in America. And here, it must be very strange for him. So I turn the panel. Thank you, John. Um, I hope you can live up to this. And segment. of course, thanks to the Dyson family for having me up here in this uh, beautiful environment that makes me feel at home already. It's probably more exotic for you. Um, now, in a family like you, I mean, you 
worked on a, on, a, on a nuclear pulse rocket ship, you worked on kayaks, you made uh, uh, our genome and our memory visible on the web, so quite different achievements. But is there a lot of agreement in a family like this, or is it more a disagreement culture in your family? I don't think we disagree enough. <laughs> it's a problem to have an argument on stage when we agree about all the important things. <laughs> or, or we agree to disagree. Or, or we agree that we should just do different things. But what's interesting is how it all circles back to trying to figure out not the future, but what's going on now, so that you can understand the future. Well, could you even, I mean, but you, you, you laid, you all three laid the foundations for a lot of things that then later on created the future. So you definitely say there is no way to look into the future. With your, with your work? I, I'm safe because I'm a historian, so. <laughs> but if you, if you talk about now, I mean, especially in this room, in this, in this conference, everybody has this feeling we right now live in these really revolutionary times. I mean, science and technology seem to be at such a cutting edge and they like have influenced our daily life more than ever, so. Freeman Dice, maybe you can give us some perspective. Do we live in revolutionary times right no, now? No, I would say not. But of course, it all depends what you mean by revolution. It's, it's uh, thank you. It's, uh, we have had four revolutions. Space, nuclear, genetics, uh, and computing. All four of them started roughly at the same time after World War II. And we're feeling the consequences now. So I would say it, these are times of change for the public, times of social change. They're not times of revolution in science. We're waiting for the next revolution in science. That's still to come. I, I mean, I think what you learn from science is how complex everything is. So you want to model the world so you can understand the forces, the tensions. You know, this thing is built of wood, not very interesting. If you understood the forces on the beams, you understood the forces of gravity, so you could predict what might happen if somebody dropped a bomb on it or someone lit a match under it, but you can't predict exactly where the fire will travel because you don't know the wind. And so what you understand is how to interpret what's happening, but you really, there's so much you can't predict. The more you know, the more humble you become. And he's the humblest of them all. <laughs> um, but if you are part of, I mean, then if you say that the revolution already happened 50, 60 years ago, the scientific revolution, and you were part of it, are we aware that you're part of a revolution? Oh, yes. I mean, this was obvious. We were just so lucky, This my generation who came into science when all these great discoveries had just been made, the new technologies were open for us to enjoy. And that, uh, that there was a fifth revolution, I should mention, which is actually not yet understood, and which still may turn out to be as important as any of the others. That's something that happened about five years ago, the discovery of human accelerated regions in the human genome. That uh, it was the work of a friend of mine called David Hossman, a young biologist in California. And these are pieces of the human genome which have no apparent distinction. They are, look like any other little pieces of DNA, except that they have been strictly conserved all the way from chickens to chimpanzees. He looked at the genomes of chickens and rats and mice and dogs and cats and chimpanzees. These little bits of DNA are all identical all the way from birds to mammals, so they've been unchanged for 300 million years. And they're radically different in humans. So there's something there that has changed dramatically in the last five million years which made us what we are. And, and that's a, a revolution in science which has not yet hit the public, but I think it certainly will. So in that sense, you may say the revolution is here, but it hasn't yet shown its effects. 
the, in, if you look at these two pieces of, in, of, of DNA, they are both of them active in the embryonic brain and the embryonic wrist. The brain and the wrist, of course, being parts of the human which make us different from chimpanzees. So, being a member of the public, that makes me, of course, curious. I mean, what are the implementations of this discovery? Yeah, there are two things that can come out of it, which are, first of all, to understand what the genome is actually doing, because these are not genes. These, these bits of DNA are not coding for proteins. They're not genes in the ordinary sense. They're just little bits of DNA producing probably some kind of RNA, which nobody understands. And so it is the start of a new science of interpreting the part of the genome which is not genes. And the second thing is, of course, understanding of human nature, which is something that we must approach with fear and trembling, but it's something that we certainly have in our future. That sounds like there's an imminent uh, mankind wide identity crisis coming up if, <laughs> if you have that. But I mean, you, for example, you work with 123Me where you take the understanding of the genome that we have uh, as of today and you take it to the public. I mean, what, what is the reaction to the public to a, such a vast new technology um, that they can now commercially use? Well, of course, it, it's 23andMe as in 23 uh, chromosomes. 23. It's okay. Uh, different parts of the public react differently. Certain people in Congress and in the F Food and Drug Administration react rather badly. They think this is really dangerous inf information for individuals to have for whatever reason. Uh, other people perhaps react overexcitedly and think, my gosh, you've, you've uncovered the mystery of human life. But in fact, most of what we're doing with the genome and especially at 23andMe right now, is, is mostly statistical, looking for correlations. And what's interesting is actually looking at how the genomes, how the genes work, how they create proteins, how epigenetics, how, how they work, uh, rather than simply which ones are present in people with which kinds of conditions or tendencies. So we're really, really very early. The 23andMe users are mostly benefactors. They're not yet beneficiaries, but they're... What they are doing is contributing, you know, we have user-generated content, we have bottom-up revolutions. They're contributing to user-generated science. And of course, some scientists think this is bogus and how can normal people contribute anything to my holy work? But other scientists say, wow, this is really great. We're getting a lot of data and maybe we can do something useful with it. Um, I mean, this is one, form that made the revolution that uh, also a re scientific revolution understandable for the public but um, you just mentioned some fields where you uh, that you also worked in and they're all very very revolutionary but also until today very controversial and especially in Europe I mean it seems like I mean we kind of invented cultural pessimism so um, it's the debates here about science are very different than in the states um, how how, do, how does science deal, and is it different? I mean, are the si debates about science more heated now than they used to be, or um, is, is, has that been a droning thing since um, you started to work? Well, it, it's always seemed to me that the, the Germans are too much interested in philosophy. <laughs> <laughs> <No>. <laughs> So that was, uh, that was always true. I mean, in the 19th century, you had Nietzsche preaching all kinds of weird doctrines and people taking him very seriously. Whereas in my country, which is England, we never took Nietzsche seriously. And I think probably that was wise. <laughs> and so, so this same cultural divide is still true today in a way that in America, we are practical people and we make mistakes, but they're not so much philosophical mistakes. They're mostly practical mistakes. And so it, the cultures are different. I'm, I'm happy they are. We, the world should have many different cultures. It would be a shame if we all think alike. 
Well, science kind of made history just recently in Germany again. It's like after Fukushima happened, I mean, we had a massive shift in, poli in policy and politics that <laughs> I see you gearing up. <laughs> Should I stop the question? <laughs> I'd argue that wasn't science. And, and neither was the accident really a nuclear accident. It was an accident due to a lack of transparency, to corruption, to repairs that were made badly, to a culture that simply would not respond to reports from people working on the plant that there were problems, that the repairs were being done badly. And so that could have been a coal plant. The kind of accident would have been different. But, you know, it's, it's un... Yes, the plant did have a problem, but it was not a failure specific to nuclear power. It was more a failure of a kind of governance. Well, I mean, and it certainly wasn't right. science. Uh, around here and uh, also around the world, a lot of people saw that moment as kind of epif as an epiphany. Um, even like people who were supporting nuclear science, uh, nu nuclear uh, power before and. Um, they probably would disagree and I mean do you agree with that it was just a small event Fukushima? No, I would say politically it, it was a disaster of major proportions <laughs> only it was in fact not so different from other accidents and but the politics of course is different and the world is unfortunately driven by politics more than by facts and you, you have a political situation, I, I really actually worldwide, if something really bad happens, you want to blame somebody. I'm, I'm in the space industry, and some guy is going to die or some woman's going to die in a commercial space flight one day or another. And the antidote to that is not pretending from the start that this stuff is safe. The world is not safe, but we need to make it safer, and we can do that best by transparency about the risks. And faster work on reducing those risks. Well, you took that risk. You had cosmonaut training no, recently. I, I wasn't able to take the ultimate risk, but I will. <laughs> so, um, coming back to the family, does that make a father proud if you worked in spaceships in the 50s and you have your daughter? Oh, it was a marvelous surprise for me, yes. Yeah. Well, I, I had sort of a different view. I, I, thanks to Esther, got to go to Kazakhstan, to Baikonur, to watch this rocket take off with, with her friend Charles. And, and my reaction was that I couldn't, absolutely could not believe it, because I grew up as a child. Freeman was building this spaceship that was supposed to leave in 1965 with 50 people for Mars and Saturn. And, and the American, the, you know, the question was whether the Americans or the Russians or both would take over the solar system. And here, here we are, 52 years after Sputnik, and I'm watching an American pay $35 million to ride on a Soviet-era Russian rocket it was to low Earth orbit. And so, you know, we, we really, Freeman is right, that the, re the revolution happened 50 years ago, and we, you know, our job is to deliver on it, and in some cases we've, we've quote, failed. I'd say Mars is a little bit more bold than the other stars. I mean, where there is design these spaceships for one-way tickets? Or, I mean, it's quite a long way to Mars. <laughs> yeah, we had, uh, I would say, of these four revolutions, two of them were outstandingly successful. Those were the, 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 the computer and the genome. And one was an outright failure, that was nuclear. <laughs> and the, 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 the last one was sort of halfway. Well, we'll see. What, what's your take? Is it going to take off commercial space flight? Um, yeah. Well, I'm invested in it, and I have... Okay. So I'm, you're biased. I mean, I'm trying to make it happen. But, yeah, I think taking a one-way ticket to Mars makes an awful lot of sense. And building a new environment using synthetic biology, which is, you could call it an extension of also genetics, to terraform Mars. And then someday we'll take that that learning from how to terraform Mars, and we'll come back and we'll terraform Earth properly. And, and well, the important thing is, of course, to, to, to the fact that unmanned missions have been outstandingly successful. That it, yeah. because computers have led the way, particularly 
information processing turned out to be enormously cheap and enormously effective, we are able to send little spacecraft to Saturn and to Pluto and to other places in the solar system. And they do a marvelous job of exploring, much, much better than we could have done with our nuclear propelled ship. And that's all going ahead. What we have not discovered is how to use human beings effectively in space. And it's not clear how we're going to do that. But that's only half of the problem. And, and, and it's also, half? Well, one, another part of the problem is funding this. Uh, you, NASA keeps getting its budget cut and Congress people keep trying to design rockets, which they're not really very good at. Um, well, they, they, the problem is they, design rockets that have to be built in separate pieces in different congressional districts, and that right. just doesn't work. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's also not true that the NASA budget has been cut. The, cut, well, the budget's remained essentially fixed mm -hmm. for, for the last 10 years or so. And, and, but the problem is that the, the individual projects have been badly managed and have overrun the costs, right. so that effectively the, 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 the budget is squeezed, but it's not really been cut. Yeah, okay, it, the costs keep rising, so right. they can do less and less, and every time they have a mistake, they create hundreds of new regulations that give it more rigidity. Nope. I had NASA come to me trying to get some documents back that I had copies of, and they had lost all their surviving copies. <laughs> and so they ordered photocopies of 1,629 pages of documents, and uh, I'll preface that by saying Project Orion, which was going to deliver 1,300 tons from the surface of Earth to the outer satellites of Saturn and return with 1,300 ton payload to low Earth orbit in single stage. That entire project was done on a 23-page contract. And the, <laughs> the, the contract for NASA to pay me five cents a page for these photocopies was 36 pages. <laughs> That's, that's the end of the revolution. Yeah, that, that, that's why we're on the ground still. <laughs> so would, would private industry um, be better uh, to make these scientific revolutions into scientific realities? Yes, undoubtedly. And of course, it has been outstandingly the case with computers. Von Neumann originally designed his computer and completely misunderstood what it was going to be doing. I mean, von Neumann always imagined his computers as big state-controlled and state-owned operations with only experts in charge. He never imagined they'd become toys for three-year-olds, and, and it all happened in about 20 years because of private industry. It's two, two big things happened in computers, which was what Freeman just said, the privatization, so you had you went from mainframes to PCs for individual people, and you went from the government-sponsored, developed internet to the World Wide Web of today. And that's what we're trying to make happen with commercial space as well, bring in private entrepreneurs, make it accessible to individuals or groups of individuals, turn it into something that people want to invest in. And so when I go now down to Mojave, I see companies' logos on the sides of rockets. <laughs> it's so exciting. No, the problem is, of course, in, 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 as a scientist, I simply don't care whether it's done by the government or by private industry. It's, it's a mixture of both anyway. But what has happened to scientific space is payloads cost more than launches. So you really don't care about the launch, you only care about the payload. And the payloads are going to be expensive anyway. They are one of a kind, and they're not, so they're not suited to mass production. So it doesn't really matter who builds them. But for humans in space, it matters enormously. And that's so, I, I certainly believe very strongly in the privatization of human space. You still haven't sold me on the one-way ticket, though. No, I, I, I mean, there will be one-way tickets, of course. Just people have, have, have spread over this planet with one-way tickets for, for thousands of years, and we're very good at that. 
You, you took one from England. Well, yes. Any regrets ever? No. no. <laughs> um, I mean, you came to America from, from, from a former, uh, basically a, a place in shambles, Europe, and you came to America, and um, was that your first impulse to go to America because there's the land of America? No, opportunity? on the contrary, I'd intended to go to the Soviet Union after World War II finished. World War, uh, Soviet Union was the place which I found most exciting, and I loved the language, and I loved the, the, the science that they do there, and the, the, the atmosphere of mystery that surrounded it. So I was all set to go to Russia after the war ended, and then, unfortunately, Stalin made it clear that he didn't welcome foreign students, so I came to America as a second choice. <laughs> Was that a general, a general verdict, or, or did he have anything <laughs> against you in particular? Oh, it, it was extremely happy for me. Of course, I came to America at just at the time when these scientific revolutions were breaking and when I could contribute. So it was a very big, great piece of luck for me. Well, if, if, if you would be a student now, would you go to America again from Europe? I'm not sure. I probably would go to China. I don't know. <laughs> Why China? Because that's where things are happening. Um, there. And, and yep. just, I mean, for what it's worth, I'm going to Russia. And the reason is because I see all its problems as opportunities. And it has a lot of them. That's, right. that's a very scientific approach to, <laughs> to a place like uh, Russia. Um, and you're in Canada. Uh, yeah. So now I'm, I'm in the U.S., but I'm right on the border. I'm in the place called Bellingham, which is the Tijuana of Canada. It's the, the <laughs> American border town. Can you get, like, $5 wedding licenses there as well, uh, with tequila on the side? Yes. Yeah, so I used to say, but like, you can, you, you can um, get the American Postal Service, so you don't suffer Canada Post, but you can still get the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation, which is... <laughs> um, well, if things are happening right now in, in China, of one places, and where in these uh, implementations of the revolutions that you were part of, where do you see the most potential for, you wrote about science having always two sides of the, be to, to, to serve the better or the worse of man. Where do you see the potential for the better of man right now in science, in the implementations? Well, in biology, certainly. I mean, biology is going, from a practical point of view, is going to be the world-transforming science for this century. And, and so uh, I'm not a biologist. I don't have any skills that would be useful to, to biology, so I don't do it. But I, as a spectator, I enjoy it as, 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 as an important part of the, the world we live in. And we're, we're, we're going to see in the next 50 years, radical transformations due to essentially the, our ability to hold the biosphere in our hand. I mean, that we've sequenced at the moment about 1% of the biosphere, and in another 20 years or so, we'll have sequenced all of it. So and by that time, with luck, we shall also understand something of the language in which the genomes are written, which at the moment is quite incomprehensible. And so we shall have the power to manipulate or to create tools for all kinds of purposes. We can, we can imagine biology providing a substitute for mining and for manufacturing. We can grow things instead of making them. And that might lead to a better world in many ways. It could also be abused. That's our choice. I mean, people seem to be very scared. I mean, this seems to, uh, outside of nuclear power, this, seem, or, um, this seems to be one of the fields where people are more scared about because they're exactly scared about what we might grow. I mean, what would be the possibilities if, you, if we really decode the whole biosphere to, to, to actually grow? Of course we don't know. And 
everything you do in life is a risk. And there's no such thing as a safe world. So it's a gamble no matter what you do. It, certainly saying no to biology is not going to make the world safe. Some, some people do think, think, think so, though. Yes. Why, 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 why wouldn't it be safer to not tr go in certain directions? Well, because nature can always think up surprises. Nature is, is cleverer than we are. And if we don't do biology, we can still get wiped out by all kinds of natural disasters. And, and I would just say there's a very fundamental connection between these two worlds of biology and computing, which goes back to the very beginning that Alan Turing, who brought us this world, whose mother was four months pregnant 100 years ago, he, he sort of invented what we now consider the modern computer trying to solve this problem with it, well, in Scheidung's problem. And, and the result was, I mean, by inventing the computer, he was able to, to answer this question is no, that by, there is no, and this is, can, is mathematically provable, that there's no way by looking at a sequence of code to tell what that code, to predict what that code is going to do except to run it. And that fundamentally is, is true of biology and computing. It's, it's why we can never have a complete digital dictatorship where, as long as you have a firewall that admits arithmetic, you cannot predict what the code is going to do. And it's the same in biology. We're, we're never going to be able to predict what an organism is going to do by looking at the code. So we, we really are in this, and I think to, to assume that in any way we can predict it and stop it is, is, is hopeless. Or, to, or to, put it in, to put it another way, the, the only way to completely eliminate risk for humans is to kill them all first. And then they can't kill anybody else. I mean, it's, life is fundamentally unknowable. Somebody's going to do this. We might as well try and do it openly and transparently rather than make things illegal and secret and dangerous and then the bad guys will do them. I'd rather have the good guys do them. That would be a rather unfortunate choice to kill us all. But um, I always thought that code would be the most rational and biology the most unpredictable of all the... They're the same thing. No, arithmetic, uh, like the codes in arithmetic? And well, that's, code that is so becoming analog, as, as George was yeah, saying. I mean, that's what's so counterintuitive about this, this proof, that it shows that even, even in a perfect, and this is, this is provable in a, in a deterministic universe, where every single bit, your computer never makes mistakes, you still cannot predict what a code is going to do. And that's, a, that's a very profound thought. And of course, in the real world, it is not deterministic, so it's even less but so the, so the view that we can have some sort of ultimate commission that decides whether a code is going to be good or bad is, is just flawed from the very beginning. And, and that's, that's in some ways a, a greater risk that we end up with you know, appointing some political power that, that things can be decided. That, that's never worked. I mean, anything powerful can be used either way. I mean, good so There's another theorem which is not so well known which was proved by two mathematicians, I forget their names. But, uh, anyhow, it says that analog computing is in principle more powerful than digital computing. That there are, there are numbers which are computable by analog machines, which are not computable by digital machines. So it means no matter what you do with digital machinery, analog processes will always be unpredictable. And nature, of course, works analog much more than digital. So the idea that, anything, that everything can be understood with digital machinery is, fails in, a, in an even more practical way. But don't we now live in a digital age and we're approaching the biological age? Oh, okay. No, There's the, agreement the, the, here. I mean, the bio, biology is mostly analog. Right. And that's, so that's why, if we move into the biological age, we need more analog than digital. And, and we're analog. Excuse me? We are analog. We are analog. We, we are, we, yeah, I mean, we're the ultimate analog machines, no? And, and much of the 
current new wave of computing is analog, not digital, which is, which is I, th I think, what I said here last year, that, that we're, we're entering the age of, we're going from a sort of post-digital, we're not going to give up the digital way of doing things, but the, the really successful companies are actually doing analog computing. They just, they just won't admit can, it. Can you give so, me an example of what analog computing would Google, be? Google, Facebook, right, you know, all these companies where the, the real information is not in the code, it's in the topology of the network, and that's analog, not, not digital. But and all the pattern recognition stuff. So next year, Steffi, ALD. Um, now, you worked, all of you worked for such a long time in, in like on the, on the frontiers of science. Um, does that still give you room to marvel? Oh, yes. Oh, it's, I mean, uh, science is all about things we don't understand. That, that's, uh, and that's still true. The, the more science we do, there are more and more mysteries. Most the things we find which are completely surprising and difficult to stomach. That's what it's all about. And what, what were some of the latest um, discoveries that, that like created this awe in you again or, or, or understandings? Well, of course, in my own field of physics, dark energy is the latest excitement at, at the fact that the universe is accelerating. Nobody expected that. Nobody understands it. But it's true, and it's a, it's a profound discovery. But that's, uh, that just happens to be the latest one, but there are many others. And, and for you? Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm much more homespun, but I still always take a window seat on the airplane. It's just... <laughs> It's amazing what you can see if you look. Right. And you're... Well, obviously, I, I f follow science, but I don't, I don't practice it. But yeah, it's e every single field is, is full. Of, for, essentially, for every question you answer, there's, it raises two more. And that's, that's just the way it is. So there's particularly in the frontiers of ast astronomy and biology and genetics, particularly that the... I mean, back to von Neumann, he, he believed that even floating point was unnecessary, that if that, you know, you should be a real mathematician to use a computer. And yet now we have, you know, 30 or 40 levels of languages before you get down to, to that. And it's, it's obviously going to be the same in genetics, that the real interesting stuff is in way higher level languages than we even know exist now. And so, so the sort of the genetic linguists are going to be busy for a long time. I'll, I'll give you another answer also. I'm, I'm really lazy. And I'm also lazy on behalf of everybody else. So it offends me when I see people... It offends me. No, no. I'm, it offends me when I see people doing useless work or doing things that would not be necessary if they knew more. So the things that excite me are not high-definition TVs for white guys in Silicon Valley. But yesterday I saw somebody building an information service that provides personalized information to farmers in India about how much fertilizer they should use based on their crops, based on the weather. And those things scientifically aren't that interesting, but they use all the stuff we're talking about, weather prediction, uh, personalization, computers, cheap communications, and they create miracles for normal people. And that's exciting. No, I totally agree with that. And I mean, that's why I find China so exciting. India is a, equally exciting, I, but I know less about it. Though that, those are places where science is really going to, to change the way people live and the way people think. So, even though you said there is no way to look into the future, as a last question I would like to put out to you, if you do see the next a next revolution on the horizon that will have similar impacts like the revolutions from the 40s and 50s that we are feeling now. Uh, do you want to start? Do you want to start? Uh, sure, if, if I'm not taking the answer from, from Freeman, but I think it's this, the fact that we sequence the entire genome of the planet in, in a sense makes real something that's been sort of under the table for a long time, that actually we are part of a, a single organism, that, that life on this planet really is a single organism, and, and now we are going to have this 
just flood of no matter what people do and no matter who tries to stop it of genetic transfer in a completely different way, making, making the planet really alive as a single organism in a, in a way that, that we, is how biology works, but we're, we're going to have to face it in a much faster evolutionary time scale. And, yeah? Yeah, I'd like to add to that that I believe the colonization of space is not just a matter of humans going out and making little colonies on Mars or someplace where they have to live in habitats and uh, wear space suits. That's not going to be the future. The future is going to be a complete biosphere being sent. And what is going to happen in 20 years from now is you can make something the size of a chicken egg, which contains only about a microgram of DNA, which is a complete biosphere with all the plants, animals, insects, microbes, viruses, everything that needs to make a living planet can grow. And then afterwards, if you like, humans can go and live there. But it will be a, a living planet where the humans ca ca can live in the open air and, and, and in, enjoy the, the freedom of be, being at home. And that's part of the solution of the ecological problems as well. If you can make a new biosphere somewhere else, then we could afford to keep things the same on the Earth. We can afford to say, if you want to be different, you better go somewhere else. <laughs> so that the, the problem of stabilizing the conditions on the Earth and still giving room for adventure outside can be solved at the same time. Okay, uh, first I'd like to second that. Uh, and then the other thing that really excites me is taking the synthetic biology we're going to use for Mars and applying it to personal medicine along with using some of the analog social computing George was talking about to motivate people to live healthier so that they don't get sick as much. And you can hear David Agus about that tomorrow, which should be really interesting. So um, I guess we skimmed the surface of a vast ocean of knowledge here. <laughs> and um, time is up for a little while already. So um, I thank you so much for being here and sharing uh, with us. And uh, wish you a wonderful time in Munich. Thank you very and much. Thank you.